risen. Yeah. This is uh, the, church, the book that we've been going through in 1 Corinthians there. At the end of the book, there were people in the church at Corinth that didn't believe there was a resurrection. And so the whole 15th chapter, I'm, we're not going to read it now, okay, so you don't have to turn there. But the whole 15th chapter has to deal with uh, the resurrection and bodily resurrection. And if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then every single one of you are here this morning, including myself, number one, just a waste of time. This is for nothing. But if he did rise from the dead, and that's what Paul says uh, that happened, and he was an, an eyewitness, <laughs> and so is Peter and a lot of the others, uh, were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. And so uh, it's a joy to kind of celebrate this this morning. Would you turn to Matthew, the 28th chapter, or 27th chapter, and go to the end of the chapter. I'm just going to read two sections of of the story, and we know it well. Bruce read a, a parts of it and told us a part of the Gospel of John, and I'd like to read some of that too. <clears throat> but just to refresh our minds as to what happened that day that he was resurrected from the, the grave. And let's start in verse uh, uh, 62 of chapter 27 of Matthew's Gospel. <clears throat> Jesus said, last week what we talked about was his death, his crucifixion by his wounds. We have been healed. And so life comes in through the wounds of Christ. He paid the price for our sins. But now we celebrated kind of his death last week and had the Lord's Supper, which really uh, is what we do in remembrance of him for what he did. But now we're going to the rest, as Paul Harvey used to say, some of your older ones will remember that, the rest of the story. So in verse 62 again begins, The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how this imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal away and tell the people, he is risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. And so the people, there were many in Jesus' day that thought he was a fraud. And they were afraid of what would happen if he did rise from the dead. But Pilate said to them, you have a guard and soldiers, go make it secure, make it secure as you can. Yeah, boy, wouldn't that turn out to be a fiasco there. For they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, chapter 28, now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His, his, uh, his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. Like Bruce said, some of the times when the uh, angels appear, they appear in ways that bring fear and shining. It's not used to what we're used to seeing. No human being shows up all of a sudden like this out of the blue. But angels, and again, angels are different, aren't they, kids? You learned that. Can you become an angel, or after you die, become an angel? No. Well, one real person remembered. A couple shake their head. Yeah. We don't. They're different creatures and, uh, than us. But anyway, the clothing of white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Come and see. Come and see. He's inviting them. You know, and maybe you've heard this before, but the angel didn't roll away the stone so that Jesus could come out. <laughs> a stone wasn't going to keep Jesus from coming out, but the stone was rolled away so that we could go in and take a peek and see that he's not there. That this was literally a fact that happened in history. And... Uh, Anyway, we'll continue here. Where was I? <laughs> see, uh, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb and, and with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests 
all that had taken place. And when they had assembled the elders and taken counsel, they gave sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people the disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Uh, bribes, accepting bribes to say something. Number one, they never came up with a body. It would have been easy to prove that the body was stolen if they just come up with a body, wouldn't it? But they never did. They never came up with a body. And so, and if you'll turn with me to John's Gospel, Bruce had read where, in chapter 20, John chapter 20, where he appears to the twelve that, that same evening of the resurrection, but starting in verse 24, uh, this is eight days after that. Thomas was not with them. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, verse 24, John 20, 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see his hands and the marks of the nails and the place my finger and the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, what did he say? Peace be with you. That's what Bruce talked about. Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not, be, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He didn't scold Thomas for his great unbelief. He said, look, look, look at my hands. See them, put your fingers in them. And Jesus was so, so loving in that way. He wants people to believe. Bruce said, part of our job is as the, as I, as I have come into this world, now I send you out. And the Lord, by a dream from Macedonia, we didn't know where Vermont was. The Lord has sent us here to Vermont, and we're doing that very thing. He sends us out to preach this gospel. And again, the goal of our preaching is that you might believe. And uh, so if you're getting at what I'm doing, I want the same thing Jesus did here. I want you to see those wounds that were meant for you and so on this morning. So that's the story we're going to look at today. I'm going to read a lot of scripture. I'm just going to tell you they're in the Bible. If you want later on, I'll give you references for every single one of these things. Um, but I want to talk about a subject, uh, since it is resurrection, I'll back up a little bit and uh, say, why, why is there so much death in this world? And then Ukraine right now, too, you have uh, the fighting and the wars going on, not only there, there are many places in the world right now where uh, there's a lot of that. There's the, the subway shooting in New York City, was that right? Uh, where people were killed. There is today a mother, a father, a little child, even a baby that has cancer and is dying. There's car accidents. Uh, many things are happening. Uh, Mark's relative here today, we can pray for the 14-year-old girl in, in Albert just passed away of a heart attack this week in school. And so the families are hurting. Death is real. It's real. It's something, whether you like it or not, you will face it one day, and one day it'll be my turn if the Lord carries. And so these are things we talk about. Why? Why is it that there's so much of that? Why do we die? You know, if, if God is so much for life, why is there so much death in this world? But let me take you back to a place and a time when there was no death. You go back to the beginning, Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says all the things that he made, and he made man, and he made a woman. And after everything he created, he looked at it all and says, this is very good. Very good. Every time he makes something, he says, oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. And he enjoys it. He delights in it. And he used to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden and walk and have fellowship. And all, And there was no death. There was no sorrow. There was no disease in the, in the land until one day when sin entered the world and they disobeyed God. And as a result of that, we continue to suffer the consequences. The curse has come upon us and this world and the created order too. 
and it's affected every single one of us. Um, uh, death uh, is brought, that curse is, is death. Death is called an enemy. Did you know that? You know, the God who gave us life and stuff looks at death as an enemy. <clears throat> so we ask ourselves, why is there death then? Why is there death? And there's two, it's two verses that come to mind. There are many more, but uh, the one maybe many of you know, the wages of sin is the payment. I sin. I, it's, it's like I'm working for money. I'm getting wages for doing something when I work for somebody, right? But when I sin, I get wages, and the wages for that is death. In Romans, Paul says, uh, so death passed to all men because all sin. So death is a result of sin. And that's how uh, it has affected us. <clears throat> but you know, the encouraging part is, and with the resurrection and everything, death is not the end. Hmm? Isn't that, doesn't give you encouragement. Death is not the end. There is life after death. Uh, many even today don't believe in a resurrection. My grandpa, I think was an atheist for practical purposes, and he said it's just like a dog. When a dog dies there, it lies in it. That's it, and that's what's going to happen to humans. But boy, was he wrong. <laughs> and later on, he became a Christian and learned otherwise. And uh, so uh, some people believe all kinds of things about death, life and death. They believe in reincarnation. They come back as some, somebody or something else. And uh, But the Bible gives the answer for these things. Read about it. You'll see. That's why I encourage you guys. Everybody out here in this room ought to have a Bible. You ought to read it and see what does God say about himself, number one. Because let me repeat this. I say this often, but I'm going to say it again. God is not who you think he is. Right? God is not who you think he is. He is who he says he is. And that's what you have to stick with. And what he says, the Bible says about him today, we're going to keep talking about these subjects. Um, uh, I think it was Peter Green, but I'm not sure the story. Uh, somebody, or some relative died. And uh, they were going to the fun funeral home to see him before the guests came in. To sort of the body was in the casket, and the front half was opened up, you know, so they could see the face and the, the torso, uh, but not the. And uh, Peter was looking in, and he looks up there, and he says uh, to the undertaker, "He says, can I see his feet?" And the undertaker just well, bewildered a little bit. Why he wants to see the feet? And he finally says, "Oh, sure, you can." So he he opens up the casket, and he sees his his body, you know, his legs and his his feet, and he says. Which part of them went to heaven? You know, he heard that so-and-so died, his relative. And so, and he sees him there and says, well, he's not in heaven. Or did his feet go to heaven? So that's why he wanted to see the feet. But, I mean, we, that's kind of funny. And from a kid's perspective, maybe. But a lot of adults don't have no clue, have a clue as to what happens after death. What What is death, by the way? Uh, what is death? The Bible defines it. In J the book of James, it says that it's, it's when the... This body and the, the soul, that soul, the real you that's in you, that part that's not physical, that you can't see, the real you, it's when those two separate. Isn't that interesting? This body that you see here, one day will be no more. Probably not very long from now. <laughs> it, it'll be in the grave, it'll rot. You know, even now, Lazarus was four days in the tomb. He said, Lord, don't open that ghost. <laughs> By now he stinks. By now he stinks. Isn't that what happened? Don't you... Have you ever been, I pulled off some uh, places in Europe that were just kind of pull off places to eat, you know, or have a, not really a rest area, but you go there and you smell some dead animal or something. It's awful. And, and you say, ah, oh, you can't really get an appetite. But this is what sin has done all along. It just corrupts everything. And this body that you see, one day it'll be no, the real me. There's a real you called a soul or spirit. Sometimes the Bible uses both those terms. So if I use them interchangeably today, you know what I'm talking about. But the real uh, spirit, I sometimes use an illustration of a walnut, you know. Here's you see the outer shell, right? And that's the outer part of it. That's the body that you see in a human being. But you can open up the thing and find the nut inside. That's the soul, the real you. And so when you see it, go to a, a, cemetery or a, a burial and they have the body laying there, what you're looking out is just, at, as just that outer shell. The real nut inside is gone. <laughs> gone somewhere, right? But it's It's gone. And so that's what the Bible talks is a separation between the real you and the body that's left behind. And I'll give you a few illustrations of that. Rachel, remember the Old Testament, Rachel was having a baby and she died giving birth to this child. 
And so it says here in the scriptures, and her soul, as her soul was departing, she named the baby. As her soul was departing. See that? See how the Bible defines death? Um, Elijah, this boy had died. This widow, had, uh, this uh, mother had had uh, no children. God gave him a miracle, gave him a miracle child. But that child later died and she called for Elijah and he came back. And he prayed that the dead would rise. The death did rise. But here's how he said it. Um, he said, uh, he prays that the dead child's soul would come into him again. And it did. And he lived. But that's the separation, see, and life came back. Then uh, at death in Ecclesiastes, it says that the dust returns to the earth. This is part of me. The dust returns to the earth as it was, and this and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Jesus said from the cross, it is finished. My work here on earth is done. I've died for your sins. It's finished, he said. It's finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. That's when the death of Jesus took place. And if you want to see if there's kind of the real you kind of separated, as I say, into a couple parts here, Jesus said, uh, and do not fear those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Don't fear those people. There's people in China today. And in North Korea, just for being a Christian or sharing the faith about Jesus, you can be killed for it. And Jesus knew that some of the disciples would be killed. Many of them were. He even tells them they're going to have a, even tells what, like, what kind of death they're going to die, some of them. And so he talks about these things, but he says this, don't fear those who kill the body. That's all they can do to you. <laughs> Isn't it great that if you belong to Jesus, even though they kill this body, they can't destroy your soul. The real you can never betray. But then Jesus, and these aren't my words, so take it to heart. These are Jesus continues with that thought, and he says this rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear him. Don't fear those who they, they can all they can do is get rid of you on this earth. <laughs> but fear him who has the power to destroy both body and soul in hell. And so the part of you, part of you is eternal. The spirit or the soul of, of man and woman, it, it, the real you, should I just say it that way, is eternal. Never will cease to exist. And the Bible talks about that in different places, that, that non-physical part of you. Uh, <clears throat> but what happens to these physical bodies? I've kind of gone over it here. But the, in 1 Corinthians, it talked about in 15 that this body's a natural body. It's a, it's a physical body, and it's prone to sin. It's prone to disease. It's prone to illnesses and stuff. And it's weak, and it's perishable, and it's mortal. It dies. It just means it dies. And Paul, when he's talking about, he was getting to be an old man now in his life, and he says this, our outward self, our outward body, our outward self is wasting away. But the inward man, he called it, is being renewed day by day. The real him was growing. So, you know, I still think sometimes my body's young until I try something. Huh? How many of you guys ever do that? <laughs> we think we still got it and then realize when we start something, we get hurt. Realizing, whoops. Uh, and so we think, but we, it, we get weaker over time. The Bible's right. God's right. Everything he said about death and our bodies is true. You know, every part of you, even... <laughs> Actually, this body's going to die. You know, when I was a kid, I'm sure they said it because they say it to all the other kids. Oh, aren't they cute? Aren't they cute. And then you start to waste away and your hair is gone. And then nobody ever says that to me anymore except my wife. And I won't tell you what else she says. But anyway, uh, but this part of me, this part returns to the dust. This part returns to the dust from where it came. In the end, all of them end up being a little pile of dirt. Very encouraging. No, that's what happens with the Bible. But th this can can you see though that there's an existence outside of this body? When this spirit leaves, there's an existence outside of this. They can live apart from each other. And that's why Billy Graham was able to say this. Even before he died, Billy Graham is the great evangelist. He said, Someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't believe a word of it. I shall be more alive then than I am now. 
I will have gone into the presence of God. Isn't that great? What confidence? Because he believed this book. He believed in Christ. He went out like Bruce said, now I send you to tell others. And he went and told the world about Jesus. And he had confidence. He says, if you hear the day or read in the paper someday that Billy Graham is dead, don't believe it. <laughs> what he was talking about, yes, he laid this body down, but the real Billy Graham is with Jesus in the presence of God right now. In Luke's gospel, Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Now, obviously that man's body was going to be in a tomb somewhere, but his, the real man, the man himself, the soul, was going to be with Jesus. There's no soul sleep. There's no limbo. Here's the Bible. Absent from the Lord, Paul said. And Paul, Paul was torn in Philippians. He says, I'm torn. He says, do I, do I continue living on in this body or to be with the Lord? He said, if I had the choice, he said, I'd pick living, being with Christ. But he called it this way. Uh, I think, let me read it here again. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ. He meant to depart this body. He says it's far better. Far better than to continue living on in the flesh. Yes, it's more profitable for the people in the churches because they were about to lose one of the greatest preachers there's ever been. He says, more profitable that I stay in the flesh right now. But if I had the choice, I would depart this body right now for, and be with Jesus forever with Billy Graham there. So on. That was his desire. And then he tells the Corinthians later on, he said, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Why? And he told the Philippians, he said, our citizenship is in heaven. And in Canada, they got these passports right now, if you've been vaccinated or not. You can go into certain places. Let me ask you, do you have a passport to heaven yet? Have you got that stamp in your passport? It'll give you a visa to heaven. Hmm. Isn't that a little bit more important? That'll get you anywhere in the world, too. Because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that'll get you in anywhere. All right, the Sadducees came up to Jesus, and the Bible says the Sadducees, and one way to remember it, you want to see why they're Sadducees? Sadducees, they would say, there is no resurrection. There's no angels. There's no life after death. So they put up this story before Jesus and said, oh, what if this, this woman has five husbands and they, all of them have died? And on the resurrection, whose husbands is she going to be? And so on. So Jesus begins to answer that question. He says, uh, but Jesus answered them, you are wrong. Because you don't neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. Number one, you don't know your Bible. Number two, you don't know the power of God. You know, it takes power, doesn't it, to raise the dead? Huh? <laughs> it takes power. So he says, you, you, don't, you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what is said? Uh, is not God the God or it said, said to you by God, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob died a long time before, before this. Moses meets Jesus at, at God at the burning bush. And the way God introduced himself is I am the God. Of Abraham, Isaac, and Jesus. Not I was. They lived in the past tense. They were when Jesus said, I'm not God of the dead, I'm God of the living. They're alive right now. You know Jim Crown is alive right now, Brother Jim from this church. Uh, I am the God of the living, not a God of the dead. He never say he would say that I was Jim Crown's. You know, I am uh, I was the God of Jim Crown. I am the God of Jim. And when Jesus was transfigured, remember before the disciples, three of them got to see this and they weren't allowed to tell anybody till after the resurrection. But they went to Jesus just thinking it was another day. They walked up that mountain and Jesus was so transfigured before them that his face shone like the sun. Imagine that. <laughs> Something happened to his physical body and his appearance and his clothes were white as snow and the disciples were fearful. And then who, who ends up Moses and Elijah appeared and they talked with Jesus and they got to see this. Could you keep your mouth shut after that? <laughs> I have a hard time coming down from that mountain now. I don't want you guys to say anything about this till after the resurrection. We see the God of Moses. Moses is still alive. Elijah is still alive. In glory with God now at this time. 
When a few, when a Christian dies, a person who's received Christ, what happens? I have no a fear of contradiction to what happens to them. But Paul is encouraging the Thessalonian people and he says this, he writes them a letter and he says this, but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who, who are asleep. And that was a euphemism for dead. A, just a term that was used often, like we say, passed away. It's a little nicer than saying, no, he's dead. Passed away. But it was just kind of the same thing. He's asleep. And so they, they use that term, but it, they mean dead, about those who are asleep. That uh, you are not grieved at others who have no hope. Listen, the Christian, when you have a funeral, we grieve, he said. But I don't want you to grieve like those people out there who have, who, uh, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Those who died. God's going to bring them with him. Quite a thing, huh? Doesn't mean we don't grieve. We do. We miss them. Terrible. The grief is terrible. But I have a hope that I'll see them again someday. Isn't that something? I'm going to see Jim Crown again. And others who've gone on to glory. They're now with Christ. And he's going to come back and bring them with him. So we have a hope beyond the grave. So when we do grieve, we do grieve. But we... We kind of remember now, oh, wow, I don't have to grieve. I will see them again. John, let me read John chapter 5 here. You can turn with me if you want to. John 5, 24. There are two sides to this story, two eternal destinies. And Jesus talks about them here. John 5 and verse 24. <clears throat> truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. He who believes passes from death. Doesn't come into judgment. I like that. You, <laughs> you like that? Pass from death. And he says, truly, truly, I say, I'm verily, verily, I'm telling you the truth. Jesus does never has to, when he opens his mouth, he never should have to say, I'm speaking the truth. Just know that he is. The Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. And so he says, truly, truly, I say, to you, he who believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and he is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear it will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he is granted to the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Can you see this? He said, the day is coming, and oh man, I'd love to see a cemetery at that time. <laughs> Would you? Oh wow, when he comes. Uh, those, he has to be very specific when he's talking to Lazarus. Remember when he raised Lazarus from the dead? He couldn't just say, come out of there for everybody to come out, because there's a day coming when he's going to say, come out, and every, he had to be very specific, <laughs> holy Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Because all who hear his voice one day are going to come out of the grave. And he said, and, and this is the true part. Jesus is speaking himself. Guys, it's not what I'm saying or what I think or my opinion. This is what God in the flesh said. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There is a serious side to this. I mean, you look at the cross and how can you think? that a dying man bleeding to death there had anything to do with you or me. He did. It was my sin that crucified him. He was dying for my sin and your sin. And God takes it seriously. And if that is just total rejected, you just reject God altogether. He's done everything. He's saying, like, I want you to go to heaven. And I want you to go, but you're going to go, over, you're going to, go to hell over my dead body. You reject me, then you go to the judgment of the judgment. Um, what does he say here? 
resurrection of life and the resurrection to judgment. John Lennon wrote a song. Maybe you've heard it. Imagine. In it, the first verse from the Beatles there said, Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Forget about heaven. Forget about hell. Let's just have peace on earth right now with all that other myths out there is what he's kind of saying. And then, of course, it goes like this. You may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Well, a lot of people that wish that, a lot of people. John Lennon is dead now. And he's either gone to the resurrection of life or to the resurrection of damn, of condemnation here. Judgment. Matthew 25, 46, these, he says, will go into, away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The righteous. Those who be declared righteous by God. Well, in terms, and I wouldn't be a, a, a true preacher of the gospel if I didn't tell you this part. I don't want anybody in this room to, uh, to go to hell and say, well, Dan never told the whole truth. And Paul said that when he was done preaching to some of the people who refused to believe me. He said, I'm, I'm clear of your blood. I've told you. I've laid it upon you. I remember talking to a man in Czechoslovakia. It was still the country was Czechoslovakia. Sharing the gospel with him in our trip and another American who was traveling there. And we, we warned him about the things of God, trying to turn his heart, persuading him to turn to Christ and the love of Christ. In the end, he said, listen, all right. He says, you believe there's a hell. Oh, I can't say that I've been warned, okay? Just leave me alone. Uh, I die and I go to hell, well, then I'll go there. Because, But I refuse to listen to any more of this. And now his blood is upon his own head. But as far as for me, I, I care about you too much <laughs> to just let it be. But to tell you the truth and what the Bible teaches about life after death, because God is for your good. The song said that in it. Um, Christ, our hope in life and death. Remember, Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus in, uh, in Mark 16, or Luke 16. He said that the rich man died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. Why is God, Jesus himself, given the description? Of, of Hades like this. Lift, being in torment. And then later on, the rich man is talking back and forth with Abraham, right? And he says this, he says, and he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him, send Lazarus, who had died also the poor man in front of his house, you know, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that they may uh, warn them, lest they come into this place of torment. Jesus tells this story. It's not to manipulate people it's just it's just to show us what he's he comes from the eternal world he knows what happens all right and so he says listen this tells the story of the rich man he's in torment and when he's in torment it's not i'm having a party with all my friends is it he says listen i have five brothers i have relatives what's in his mind right now on his mind in hades he's thinking about his departed he was buried already he's gone he knows there's no hope for him but he said listen if lazarus that christian can rise from the dead and tell my brothers and warn them he says, warn them. So maybe, I, I've, I've thought of this often. When I was a younger kid and I read this story, I said, how many relatives do I have in hell today who are saying the very same thing about me? Send somebody to them. And he says, I know if somebody rises from the dead, they'll repent. Ah, he knew what had kept him out of hell. He'd heard that before. And so he wanted to tell my brothers, I have five brothers, I'm concerned for them. I don't want them to go. God never wants anybody. God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. You see that? You see that in the scriptures. He, he says, uh, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that they turn. He said, turn, turn and live. He sent the prophets to tell the people that. And so, but I just, I just lay this before you, that there are two eternal destinies. Revelations chapter 21. I'll read a few more verses here uh, on this. Revelation, the, towards the very end of the Bible, <clears throat> go to the second of the last chapter. If I can find it here. And uh, verse, starting at verse three. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. So now we got a picture in heaven. I heard a, thro a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. 
He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. This has been God's desire all along to have a people he can call his own, my children, that we belong to him, he belongs to us. This starts here in this life. We can have that relationship with God. When we repent of our sins and put our faith, we become a part of the family of God. And not only that, but there's coming a day when this is going to be all fulfilled in a literal sense where he's with us. Uh, and then he will wipe away every... And it, I love this, people. I love this. Jim had so much pain before he died. But listen to this. God, he, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That's one side. That's glorious. I don't know. I could meditate on that for days. But this is the other side. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, those who didn't believe in God, the detestable, as far as murderers and sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, <clears throat> Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I, I just want you to know this is real. This is what happens. And what it does in me is place a, a love for people. I say, God, give me compassion for people who are lost on their way to hell. He says, tell them the gospel. Tell them the good news. That there's hope beyond the grave. That they can have their sins forgiven now and live for God. So that's the reason. But I, I wouldn't be fair. In Hebrews, it says that it's appointed unto man once to die. Not twice. Once to die and after that the judgment. Jesus came on a rescue mission. To save us from our sins and to rescue us from the judgment. I, I think one of Sarah's little girls downstairs quoted that passage to me. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world. To condemn the world. But that the world through him. Might be saved. Do you see the heart of God? Do you see love? And when I look at the cross. I see nothing but love of God. He loves me enough to die in my place. Hear what I say. I'm going to quote Paul here. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he died for your sins. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel in a simple, in a nutshell. He bore your sin so that you could be forgiven. All you have to do is ask him. Ask him for forgiveness. And then begin to live for the one who died for you and rose again. It's an awesome thing. There's a song that says he left the splendor of heaven. I'm going to see how I'm going to read the words here. My dad used to sing it. Speaking of God, he left the splendor of heaven knowing his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha. There to lay down his life for me. If that isn't love, then the ocean's dry. There's no stars in the sky and the sparrow can't fly. If that isn't love, if, if that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this. If that isn't love, even in death, he remembered the thief hanging by his side and spoke of spoke with love and compassion. And he took him to paradise. Hmm. You see the heart of God in this. For mankind, for you, for me. Maybe you don't take the things of God seriously, but I ask you today to do it. God sent us. Paul's writing to the Corinthians. He says, whether it was I who preached or somebody else, we preached and you believed. 
And this is, this is a relationship that we have begun in Christ. If you're in Christ today, we'll have a relationship here on earth, but then we're going to have one in heaven. You know, I was thinking as Bruce was talking about go sending, Jesus is sending you into the world. That's why you have to tell somebody, he sent us here on a mission to spread this gospel and so on. You know, I thought of doing that in Macedonia and God had given me some guys to go. We would go into these villages and share. And the day came when I had to leave and I had those didn't have those two friends to help me. You know, that's a sad day. Sad day. With that. But we came here and then the Lord brought Bruce, brought others, brought all of you here together. We work together in this. We share the gospel together in this. And some of you are planning on leaving this area. Amazing sad. But, you know, we, we hope that this will be for the spread of the gospel that you go. Another team will form and you go out and send into the, all the world. Uh, and bring this gospel. Let me just bring this to a close as to what happens to our bodies again. In a, there's going to be a resurrection day. And I'm going to read it from 1 Corinthians 15, 50. <clears throat> I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does this perishable inherit imperishable. So in other words, this body that I have right now can't handle eternity. Can't handle seeing God. Remember, even in the Old Testament, they feared that if they saw God, they'd die. This physical body can't handle it. And so God's going to even take care of that problem. He said, he's just letting us know flesh and blood, this body won't inherit. Uh, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, just like that, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. In other words, if we're still alive, we're not going to go through the process of death, but all of a sudden our bodies are going to be transformed. We're going to have a different body, a body that can handle the presence of God, a body that is uh, raised imperishable. And those in the graves are going to come out first. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable puts on imperishable and mortal puts on immortality, then shall be come to pass the saying which is written, death is swallowed up. In victory. Right now it seems death has the upper hand, doesn't it? <laughs> There's coming a day that death is swallowed up in victory. And then he goes on, oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. Right, which is what we said at the beginning. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the victory. It comes through a person. It comes through God comes through Jesus Christ. And that's the only way to get victory over death is through what he did. And so he encourages the church this, and I encourage you too, that therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And Thomas says, look, Jesus said to Thomas, unless you, believe, you see me, you don't believe, but blessed are those who have not seen me and believe. But... Uh, Peter, let me just read a couple more scriptures. First Peter 1, 8 and 9 says this. Uh, remember, Peter saw Jesus rise from the dead with his own physical eyes. But he's writing and now he's preaching the gospel to a bunch of people that have never seen Jesus. There were, at, at that time even, when he was preaching and Paul was, there were over five, he says over 500 witnessed him at one time that he was resurrected. And a lot of those are still alive. You could go and ask them and so on. But Peter's writing to a people who had never seen Jesus come from the dead in the church. And he says, though you have not seen him, okay, you didn't see Jesus, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Night, right? Oh my goodness. This is awesome. I wish I could get the feeling of this passage here. We don't see him physically with our eyes and so on. But you know what? I love him. Do you love him? Do you love this Savior who died for you? I don't see him, but I love him. Do you love him? I've never seen him, but I believe. I was told this gospel and I believed and it changed my life as a young kid. And now he says, and we rejoice with joy inexpressible and filled with glory. Why do we rejoice so much? Because my soul is saved. I'm obtaining the salvation of my soul. 
I can't save myself. I'll never be good enough to save myself. Jesus lived that perfect life that you cannot. And in exchange for our sin, we give him our sins and he gives us the righteous life that he lived. So that when I stand before God, it's, he sees the righteousness of Christ has been imputed and credited to my account. Do I deserve it? No. I don't deserve to walk the streets of heaven. Paul said the same thing. I persecuted the church, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And that's the way any of us are getting to heaven, by the grace of God. And we live by the grace of God. So we, I love him. I believe in him and I rejoice. In the end of John, it says, Now Jesus said, Did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you might have life in his name. Life, the kind of life he talks about, this eternal life, which is to know God, to walk with God. One last scripture. You know the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, right? Jesus comes late. He's already been buried. Uh, they're mourning still over him. Jesus comes on the scene and has a talk with Martha and with Mary at different times. He said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise at the resurrection of the last day. Right? You know, he's going to rise. Yeah, he's going to rise on that. Jesus said, your brother's going to rise. See, yeah, I know, he'll rise in the, some, some of us maybe are just learning that for the first time. But she knew that much, and much, and, and Jesus said to her, I am, present tense, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life now, today. Not just in the future. I am the resurrection. I, I'm the God of Abraham right now. I'm the God of, I am the resurrection and the life now. And that's why I believe you can have spiritual life today too. Because he'll resurrect it. But anyway, he says, Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Martha, do you believe this? Put your name, insert that there, please. Do you believe this? Jesus asked her a very pointed question. Martha. Do you believe this? I can't answer for you. I've just done what God told me to do this morning. Now his resurrection, his death, burial, and resurrection demands a response from you. You will either have two responses. Reject it, just count it as insignificant, having nothing to do with you. Or you can say, I want this. I understand for the first time that he died for my sin, for my crimes. And that he's willing to forgive me of anything I've ever done or said in this life. And then to take me to heaven when, I, when he dies and live for him with ever. And the day will come when I'll get a body like his, a glorified body that will never experience death. And the two, uh, we'll have a resurrected body on that day. And then forever and ever. The dwelling place of God is going to be with men. I don't know if you've ever thought much about that, but do you believe this? We preached, Paul said to the, Thessal to the ones he preached to, and he says, and you believed. And some of you have done that, but some of you haven't yet. I've given you the warnings of what will happen. I mean, this isn't my words, people. I, I just feel, or I, sometimes, it's a birth, sometimes I lose sleep over this. Because some people ignore it. And I want you to wake up and see that if this is just coming to you, you're not a Christian because you come to church. As they say, is any more than you're a hamburger because you go to McDonald's. <laughs> a Christian, when you receive Christ and Christ comes to live and take residence in you, and then you live. And he lives his life through your life. And forgives your sins. There's only two ways to die. Die with my sins or die with my sins forgiven and have Jesus. John writes to the disciples and he says, These things have I written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. People say, isn't that? To me, as a preacher, sometimes I'll finish a funeral and I'll say, Don't you think that's kind of arrogant to think you, can go, you know you're going to heaven? 
<laughs> no, I say this is what Jesus to told me and I believe it. These things were written that you might know that you have eternal life. And then he goes, this is a condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. They love their sin. They want to stay in sin. But Jesus came. What was his name should be called Jesus? For it is he who will save his people from their sins. And he came to save us and to rescue us. You believe. And your life will be transformed in a moment's time. There's no big complicated thing to it. It's trusting in Christ instead of yourself to get to heaven. Because people that think they're getting to heaven because they're good, they're trusting themselves to get there then. I have no goodness in me. <laughs> I could never attain it. I take the righteousness of Christ as my own. I own it. It's mine. And that's what I present. That's my passport. My citizenship is in heaven. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven today, we thank you. That you in the word of God told us what death and life is and how it works and how we're raised imperishable with bodies one day. Oh Lord, parts of it are mystery, but you've given us enough to spur us on. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for this group of believers too, Lord. And for the life that we get to enjoy together. Singing your praises, living for the God who died for us and rose again. And you send us, Lord, into the world to tell people this good news. And some will believe, not all, but some will. And we pray if there's anybody among us today that doesn't believe in you, Lord, would very soon settle their eternal destiny with you and get right with you. Thank you, Lord, that you're willing to make peace. Your love is so great. You died for us when we were still sinners and enemies. Oh, Lord, but now I'm your friend. I'm your child. And I look forward to what lies ahead, both in this life and in the life to come. Oh, Lord, thank you that this life is worth living. We thank you, Lord, for your word, that you don't leave us in the dark about these things. Oh, I do pray, Lord, you would comfort those who are suffering today for the loss of a loved one, because we live in a world that is cursed and fallen and imperfect. But you send us out as lights in the midst of darkness to shine the truth of the gospel wherever we can. And so I pray, Lord Jesus, many would turn from death to life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have Jesus does not have this life. So, Lord, you're our hope in Jesus' name. And thank you, Lord. Be with each one. Speak to our hearts. Continue to keep these things on our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we would live from, for you from day to day. In Jesus' name, amen. Could we close the song with that song, uh, Oh, Sing Hallelujah? I think.